Yeah. All right. Yet another book club today, and um, it's a good one. We're going to do um, our favorite author, Ami Kassar, who wrote the book, The Growth Dilemma. And, um, you know, this book has been distributed to all of our peer group members. So hopefully they have it all in hand and uh, can call upon its resources anytime they need it. Uh, but the big thing with this, and if anybody who's sat through um, Ami's presentations, or as he had as promoted to the peer groups, inside the peer groups, they sit in a circle and they do a lot of roundtable conversation around this. So we'll try to go through the content and uh, hopefully you can, you know, spurs a couple questions in your head. But most importantly, I would use it in a peer group setting or use it when you're in another uh, setting with multiple people uh, just to basically understand like, OK, where am I at versus other people? So the growth dilemma. So um, Ami wrote this a while ago. It, the subtitle is determining your entrepreneurial type to find your financing comfort zone. Um, the agenda that we're going to do with today's session is really just take the first half of the book. Um, as you guys all know from my book clubs, um, I never can learn a book from reading it. I can only learn a book from creating a PowerPoint presentation. So <laughs> hopefully I'll be an expert at this by the end of the session. So we have a forward and we have a tale of three freshpreneurs at the beginning, which is actually an old business story. We can talk through, um, and then we get into the introduction of the book from Ami, why he did it. And we're just going to touch on the first five chapters. Um, and we may come back next time and revisit chapter four and five a little bit. So we'll see how much time we have. Uh, hopefully, this won't take too long. I'll try Let's to go. keep my questions to a minimum. Yes, please. No, <laughs> no, absolutely. You know, you were obviously, Charlie, you were a business owner at one point. So you, by all means, will have that understanding of making decisions around risk and investment. Right. Um, and by the way, when I read a book, I usually don't give a crap about the forward. I usually don't care about the introduction. I want to get right into the meat. And this book actually was good at the front end. So I wanted to capture some of this. So uh, Ami had Eric, the president of Inc., do uh, the forward on this. And he took the time to tell a story during that forward. So let's go into that a little bit. So here's a gentleman here, it's a little blurry. His name is Hill Davis. And Hill Davis is the owner of Jay Hilburn. And, um, you know, he had this business idea and I'm gonna back this up for a sec. He had this business idea that he wanted to do this like kind of high end tailored clothing type of boutique service, but he wanted to do it on the internet. So instead of having just a shop, he wanted to do it on the internet. And so, you know, he was all in. He started to get investment. He started to uh, put money in. And then uh, it was discovered that, you know, the um, how he was making these clothes was uh, very cheaply done in China. So this just destroyed um, his reputation and caused a lot of people to lose faith in him. And also uh, the business was on the ropes. Right. Uh, but what he did was um, he persevered. And he stayed with it. And to that, today, uh, Jay Hilburn's still successful online business. Um, and the way that Eric talks about it is Ami likes to use names uh, or, you know, kind of a label on people. And in this case, uh, Eric, or I'm sorry, Eric Hill would fall into what is called risk flexible, or he might be considered an aggressive stretcher. Um, and these are terms that you uh, learn about in Ami's book, especially as you get to the second half to really find out what kind of owner, how do you feel about risk and debt? So this was an example of a success story that was really, you know, on the ropes, nine out of 10 times would have closed and, and did not close. So the book begins with a tale of three fresh fishpreneurs. And this is actually an old story um, that goes back about, you know, three fishermen. So you have these three fishermen and they grow up in a town together. They know each other and they just love to fish. And the first fisherman uh, essentially stays home, catches a fish, is very happy, uh, not necessarily wealthy, but very happy and has a good life, right? So that's the first fisherman. Second fisherman uh, decided to attend class, 
wrote a business plan, um, secured a loan, um, you know, and really became an administrator instead of a fisherman. And uh, again, not necessarily exactly the way he wanted to work out, but maybe had a nicer house, right, than the first one. Something to think about. And then the third one um, was even more aggressive, and they took on even more debt and, you know, wanted to have a fish packaging plant um, and essentially spent most of their time worrying about their business. So, um, you know, from the story, you don't really get a sense that the third person's happier than the first person. So right. I think the takeaway on this is neither, uh, none of this will really identify or drive your happiness. You're going to have to say, this is what, you know, who I am at the core, and this is how I'm going to run my business. And we see this all the time in our peer groups, because um, we have people who just don't like debt and they're not going to take debt into their business. They love mm -hmm. security um, and they may never grow at the same rate as their peers. And we've seen that inside peer groups as well. So a little more stress, a little more, um, you know, anxious around money uh, from that perspective, but don't necessarily lose any sleep around debt management. So good story to start. This is ultimately the growth dilemma, right? What do you want? So introduction. This is our author, story of Ami Kassar. Ami's story is uh, very well known to uh, most people in small business, um, was a corporate person inside credit card machine, um, really offered, I think, the most credit cards to small businesses of any other credit card company. Um, it is well known that, you know, that in the uh, downturn, uh, that job was cut. And Ami uh, had to figure out his next move. He, you know, legend has it that on his way home, he went out and took out a, um, uh, or cashed a line of equity um, on his home. You know, we have those checks sitting around sometimes from our credit card companies and from, um, you know, possibly our mortgage companies where we can actually get funds really quickly, uh, possibly even at a high rate. Uh, but this allowed... <laughs> This allowed Ami, who was freshly unemployed, to have some breathing space and um, build up his next company or thought. And that's really where he moved to multifunding. And multifunding uh, obviously gets a chance to see every type of business in uh, America because of their focus around getting lenders and lending money um, to the right customer, right, to the people. So, so he has a lot of people chasing him on the bank side because they see him as a way to get to uh, the small business owner. So he gets a lot of insight into that. Um, so his message to himself was, am I investing fast enough to ensure the best long-term viability of my company? And that was something um, that really drove him to write this book and uh, ultimately, the rest is history uh, as we continue to uh, take advantage of, of his company and his services for peer groups. So the question in the book uh, that we all know about at this point is, if I gave you a million dollars, how would you invest it? And what return would you expect from it? So in this case, um, the... Uh, the money that you would take. Um, I think everybody, this is a great one. We never really think about it. And, you know, all of a sudden it's there. What are you going to do with it? Right. And I think a lot of people went through this um, during COVID when all of a sudden PPP money dropped in your lap or EIDL money uh, came to you. So in a lot of cases, uh, people needed that and they were desperate for that money. And in other cases, that money kind of came um, at you pretty quickly without, um, you know, reservation and you decided to take it. And then the question was, well, what did you do with it? And still might be, what are you going to do with it? Right. So, um, that's where we're at. So there are some additional questions that Ami poses at the front end of the book. And it is, um, are you a tortoise, tortoise or hare? And that's actually a chapter in the book. So we'll talk about what that means. Um, and then this is good. Are you a glider, a grower, <laughs> a speed bumper, or an exeter, right? And we like to call that um, entrepreneur, growth, mature, and exit in uh, peer groups. Um, lastly, are you risk averse, risk neutral, or risk flexible? 
and every year we get the composite books and every year we're able to do um, balance sheet ratios. And I can actually put that title on every single member because based on how you manage your balance sheet, we can identify which risk level you are personally. And then lastly, um, are you conservative, moderate, aggressive, or rocket ship grower? So this has to do with your big, hairy, audacious goals and how seriously you take them and how you're pursuing them. So we have some incredibly risk, uh, risk taking uh, members inside peer groups. And then we have some that are very conservative. So uh, the industry does not dictate how the owner is going to actually operate inside the industry. So million dollar question. We got a couple pictures here. Looks like fun down in the bottom. Looks like money on the left and it looks like equipment on the right. So let's talk about that. So step one, what percent do you put in the business um, and what percent would you put in mutual funds? So let's say that uh, mutual funds would generate you 6% to 8% or whatever it might be. Let's say 6% now. Um, you know, what percentage would you put into your business versus your versus mutual funds. And depending on a lot of questions and the timing of the question to you, you might feel differently, right? I would say that um, if I am not 100% committed to my business plan, I might be hesitant to put all my money into the business. So we're gonna find out a little bit more about people who were, have done that. Um, step two, if we're putting our money into the business, what is our expected return on that money? And I think that's a very critical lost question for most people. They don't really realize uh, what returns they're getting in their business. So it makes it harder to make that decision. You may be optimistic about your business, which um, you know helps you to just decide to take the money, but again, might not know exactly what, what your business is doing. So when you get a dollar, you have three options, and those three options are on the screen in front of us. You have the option to have fun with that dollar, or you can reinvest it into the business, which we see some assets up top that we've reinvested in, or we can take it out and diversify the risk and put it into other things that might make us money, such as appreciation of gold or something. Uh, next up in the million dollar question chapter, um, there is a profile and the profile is about a company called Core PHP. And it's to outline what this particular gentleman had to decide around his investment. So, so he um, in PHP, just so you know, PHP is a um, it's a code uh, like um, a programming language. And so you would um, he was basically saying, I want to use this programming language for uh, implementation and development of software solutions and um, had kind of a game plan of where it was going to go. So um, when he was given this million dollar question, um, you know, was it going to be a rational or emotional decision? In this case, there was a business motive, business plan. Uh, very rationally, he decided to take the bulk of the money. Um, and so, um, you know, at first, I think he took 100% and invested it into the company. Um, and eventually, once he got clear of the initial entrepreneurial phase, he then went to an 80-20. Um, he continued to focus on his business plan and understanding the financial of his business plan and kept saying, like, huh, if I'm doing this in my business, I got to believe I'm doing it probably better than the fund managers looking at their funds and managing them. And so that's why that per particular person kept focusing on uh, taking the money and putting it into play into his company. So he knew how he was going to spend it. He had business planning. Um, and the question now is, do you have a formula for how you would use the money? Um, I received some uh, a really cheap loan and it was a significant loan, and um, it was very quick. Um, I was trying to decide if I actually had a business plan behind it, and I'll be honest with you, it took me about a year before I started to spend any of that money. 
it has a long term to it. So um, again, be very cautious around it. But um, if, if you feel like your business is going to outperform uh, where else you would put that money, then by all means, you want to put it into your company. So let's talk about the two extremes, right? So inside of peer groups, we have event rental, equipment rental, we have insurance agents, um, we have equipment dealers, and every single owner is slightly different. In this case, um, we're going to look at 100 percenters versus safety netters and what that means. Um, can you guess? Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so safety net. Uh, want to be very cautious, right? So they use this great uh, analogy where you're on a putting green and you are lining up your putt. I just recently played this week, so I know exactly what this is about. And by the way, uh, the way I played was more like a safety netter, which meant <laughs> that um, I was leaving the ball short all day long, right? I had nine hole uh, league and um Every time I got myself in a putting situation, I would get the yips or something, and I could not putt strong. But towards the hole, yes, you might go past the hole. It's risky. So instead of taking that risk of shooting by the hole, um, I would come up short, and that again is a safety net. I would definitely, sure. -putt, but I wasn't at risk of a three putt, right? So yeah, that's the idea. Um, so then they, we get into some. Profiles and one of the things I love about this book, by the way, is every chapter has profiles about businesses, and you can actually look these businesses up online. You can see their history and all this information about them. Which, when you read a book, you have a tendency not to do that. You blow mm -hmm. right past it. Oh, that's cool. I learned a little lesson about how they treat money, but it's kind of neat to see, especially since the book came out in 2017. Where are these companies today? How are they doing? Did they grow rapidly through COVID? Did they die during COVID? All that kind of stuff. So association headquarters is uh, interesting to me, A, because they're East Coast, they're in New Jersey. Um, secondly, um, the whole basis of the company is to run associations. So we luckily inside the rental association, we have American Rental Association has infrastructure has a really nice uh, core infrastructure that uh, they're achieving tremendous things. In a lot of associations, they don't have the money for that infrastructure. So this is a fractional solution where you could go to association headquarters. And I think association headquarters does 250 associations. I might be totally underestimating, but um, again, providing management services on uh, associations, which is not far off from peer executive groups, right? We're, we're kind of acting in some small way as an association to our 230 members. Um, so these guys, as you can see from the slide, are 100 percenters. And the idea was they um, did not have a lot of risk in taking the money. They knew exactly how they were going to implement and go forward and take money and use it and grow the business. And so um, you know, there were a couple inside of the board, I believe, that were not um, as risk um, taking. So uh, whether they I think they might have had equity. So there was some consolidation of ownership. And ultimately, the person who took the lead on the company uh, continued this path and has grown it rapidly and done very well. Um, on the flip side, there was another profile. And this one, I think, is based in. Chicago, and I put artist frame service, but it's actually artists frame service. And um, what they do is obviously uh, frame work, <laughs> but the <laughs> the company, uh, the owner had been through um, quite a terrifying journey with debt. And so because of that, um, did not uh, want to be a hundred percenter. In fact, didn't even take 80% of the money. Um, they actually, I believe they turned away from the money. Um, and I'll have to check that, but, um, uh, or it might've been like they were risk averse, I think on the money. So, um, because of previous experiences and, um, unhappy results, uh, this particular person said, you know, I'm going to pass on that. And I'll, if you give me money, I'm going to put it in the stock market to diversify. And I'm going to um, grow my business organically and keep it small. 
So that was another choice that was made uh, by that gentleman. Another one was um, Immaculine. Yes, I got that right, Immaculine. So there's clean at the end. And mm -hmm. uh, again, um, these guys um, had elected not to take any money uh, for similar reasons. And um, a, a good profile in there about that type of company it was cleaning company, obviously. Um, so what does money have to do with it um, comes into play? You know, at the end of the day, um, money is just part of what we're talking about here. And more importantly, when you read this book, it's more about the psychology behind the money, right? So it's whether it's 50 grand or 500 grand or 5 million, um, it has to do with really understanding your behavior and your attitudes around risk and your attitudes around return and how much is enough and all those good things. So this chapter particularly focuses in that area. And um, uh, again, um, nobody's here. We're not gonna have a lot of conversation about it, but <laughs> that's one of them. Um, the next chapter is, um, are you a tortoise or a hare? And this is clearly, um, you know, in this chapter, they talk about a hare being the type of person that's like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to turn this just like a person who buys a piece of property and, you know, um, cleans it up, sells it. Um, mm -hmm. If you're turning, turning, turning. And in the case of business owners, um, most small business owners are not hares. You would see it at the um, you know, family office, family business level, private equity level. Um, typically, they're not looking to hold the business for too long, um, and therefore, their decisions around debt are going to be different, right, than a person who's going to be in it for 30 years. Um, obviously, the longer you're in it, the more you're likely to uh, take risk, or are you, right? So if you're fast moving, you might be like, yeah. hey, we, we need debt. We need to move quick. Um, and in some cases, it's even equity, not debt. So really, that's a, a big part of it is to say, well, are you a tortoise or a hare? My first foray into business ownership, um, my goal was to buy five subways a year for the first five years and have 25 subways. And, you know, so I was I had a model in Rochester, New York. I had another model in Miami, uh, Florida. So I knew what it looked like to have 25 subways and um, got stuck on number four. Right. So we had a MA. I was the MA guy, brought it through, and we got to the fourth subway and it hiccuped. And instead of going on to another fourth subway, uh, there was a pause button hit. And so we could not act as a hare. And my job was at the as a hare was to get money and buy businesses. So it was horrible for me. I had lost tons of sleep because, you know, as a young entrepreneur. I knew that this is not in the plan. Our plan is not to make a 10% profit on subway on, on 1.5 million of subway sandwiches, right? That was not the goal. So um, we ended up selling out of that. Um, we got a little more aggressive in another industry, which was collision, and we saw some exit on collision repair. Um, but again, if we're not going to be a hare, I didn't really want to participate at the level I was. Um, and so and eventually, you know, you move on, right? And so in my case, uh, I'm now in peer executive groups. Can you guess what peer executive groups is? That's right. It's a tortoise, right? We started mm -hmm. it in 2001. Um, it's now 21, 22 years later, and uh, we're still doing what we do. And we really haven't taken on any debt. It's been organic. Uh, we just recently took on debt. We just recently took on a lot more overhead but um, still moving very slow with the plan to uh, continue to execute slowly and get to the next uh, phase. So unless somebody drops $3 million on me instead of $1 million, <laughs> then we can do that. So that would be good. Um, okay, so the question that I'll leave you with today is where are you in your business journey? So you learned quite a bit in the last few minutes about um, this idea of debt and taking on debt. And you may not have thought about it before this uh, book club viewing, but I would say that um, now that you've been exposed, you need to start thinking about where you are in your journey. So that involves looking at your cycle, your life cycle, 
Um, are you entrepreneurial? And if you are, then you need to consider, you know, what it takes to get uh, going, get going and get ramped up. And you may have to take on more risk as at the entrepreneurial stage. Um, if you are in mature or exit stage, you might be in a totally different mindset. You don't necessarily want to take on debt that you'll be paying off when you're 90 years old, right? <laughs> so you need to start thinking about that as well. And, and also um, think about what else is out there beyond your business. So we see a lot of people exiting the last couple of years from um, the rental industry, um, also automotive industry, all sorts of industries are um, consolidating. And part of it is that the ownership is aging out. And if you're not willing to take on debt and continue to grow your business, it's probably not going to get the returns you want, which is going to change your thoughts <clears throat> about taking money and putting it into stock market or taking money and putting it into something else, right? So, so that's the concept and the idea. We're going to come back to this chapter and maybe even touch back on chapter four, which we just covered um, when we get back together next time. But um, appreciate you being here, Charlie. And um, <laughs> Anytime. Hopefully you guys get caught up and you get to watch this and uh, we can catch up for the second section of the book club. Thanks. See you guys. All right. I'm going to stop this thing somehow. How do we, there we go. Pause. <laughs> <laughs>